Okay, so here we are, uh, part five of six, and I have my pen, so I'm ready to talk and point and draw. And so uh, let's uh, talk about these two topics, the racial, uh, the race phenotypicality bias and body dissatisfaction, and try to tr tie everything up, uh, you know, about race and attractiveness. So, whoops, sorry. Race phenotypicality bias refers to the differences in racial features among African Americans. That is, in biology, we talk about a phenotype versus a genotype. The genotype is what gene you have, but the phenotype is how it's expressed. And so what we're talking about, the expression of how uh, black you are or how Asian you are, though in Technica, technically we'll be talking about how black you are because that's what most of the research focuses upon. And really what this means is a racial beauty bias uh, in that white European, uh, white Eurocentric uh, phenotypical characteristics such as lighter skin and eye color, longer and straighter hair, narrow noses and thinner lips are generally referred to, preferred to uh, to more Afrocentric features such as darker skin color, kinkier hair, broader nose, or fuller lips. And so that's what we're really talking about here when we say phenotypicality bias. It's a racial beauty bias that people prefer white Eurocentric characteristics to black Afrocentric uh, characteristics. But wait, there's more. Uh, now this is seen in white perceivers, that is white perceivers prefer lighter skinned black people to darker skinned uh, black people, but that is just plain old racial prejudice. And when we talk about the racial phenotypicality bias, we rarely talk about this first uh, version of it. It could mean that black people as perceivers are prejudiced against uh, blacker looking black people and prefer lighter looking black people. And when we do talk about the racial phen uh, phenotypicality bias, we are talking about number two. We're talking about the fact that even among black people, they prefer lighter skinned black people and less phenotypically Afrocentric uh, looking people. And again, a handful of research has been done on this, so maybe we could have a meta-analysis or a literature review. Yeah, thank you, Maddox. In 2004, uh, 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 they did a literature review on the phenotypicality bias, uh, and uh, they concluded that black participants responded less positively to other black people who have more phenotypic, phenotypically Afrocentric features. And this is especially gen general skin tone and the Afrocentricness of their facial features. Uh, Maddox suggested that there are two processes at work here. Uh, one could be that the Afrocentric features and the skin tone leads to prejudicial person characterization. That is, uh, there is an overall prejudice against Afrocentric features. And so within or without uh, uh, the group of black people, uh, people who are darker and people who are more athro have more atherocentric features are less liked than people who are lighter skinned. Or the other process is that afrocentric features and, uh, Afrocent and darker skin tone are just aesthetically less preferred. Uh, among research on the phenotypicality bias, more research is done using male targets than female targets. Uh, but in general, not much is done on this topic. And again, why is that the case? Uh, and we can go back to probably powerful implicit racism. Uh, that is implicit racism in terms of uh, how people respond to research. Uh, to get research done, you have to jump a lot of hurdles in doing that research. Uh, as a graduate student, for example, you have to get your advisor to approve the research. Uh, then you have to possibly get a grant for the research. Then you have to publish the research. 
and each one of those steps requires a gatekeeper to go through. And regardless of whether the gatekeeper is white or black, uh, due to implicit racism in our culture, each gatekeeper may, as a gut re reaction or an implicit reaction, not see research on black issues, quote unquote, as important. And so uh, there could be an implicit uh, racial prejudice against such type of research that it's not important or it's not grant worthy or it's not dissertation worthy. You know, you want to do your dissertation on something that's going to help your career, okay? So this is not it. And again, these may not be uh, conscious, uh, you know, forms of racism. But in general, there's so much bias implicitly in our culture against black issues that, uh, you know, you, your dissertation advisor, a grant committee, uh, you know, a dissertation committee, a, a journal's review board may feel funny or off about that topic and not really recognize among themselves that, th that it is a reflection of their implicit racism. Or it could be due to the powerful systemic racism. Uh, that is, uh, the research is not considered consciously uh, important uh, because, and as I said before, uh, because black people are considered to be different and white people are considered to be the standard. And so uh, why do you want to do research on this fringe area when you should, should be doing research on a main topic in social psychology? Or, uh, you know, grant institutions want to give money to, uh, you know, uh, research studies focusing on problems they think are important. And with the way wealth is distributed in our society, that means that white people are making decisions about what are the important uh, you know, problems, and they may not see uh, the phenotypicality bias as an important problem. Uh, however, considering that my students have like asked for this lecture, uh, and looking around now that I've given it for a couple years, I'm you know seeing more and more of the phenotypicality bias, uh, and uh, you know also in different con contexts. Uh, over in India, uh, there's always been a phenotypicality bias among Indians for lighter skin than darker skinned Indians. And uh, there's a powerful systemic element of it in that uh, there are beauty products available, uh, you know, to lighten your skin or to make you look less, uh, you know, dark Indian. I don't know what the specific term is. Uh, and again, these products are coming from standard Western American beauty companies. And they are very intentionally, because the money is there, uh, encouraging this type of racism in India. Uh, and so, again, the more that I look at it, the more that I see that this is a very you know, serious issue that needs to be discussed. Uh, unless I have a slide, nope, I don't have a slide for it, so I'll just say this. Uh, I'm really starting to, you know, accept that really what's going on based on the research that I see and just looking at things, that it's really, no, I want my pen. Give me my pen. It's really that uh, this process is just a special case of the general racism in our culture. And it's not surprising, you know, we talk about and I talk about how racial prejudice is in the air. It affects everybody, including black people. And so this is one way that it's affecting black people. And then finally, let's talk about body dissatisfaction. And we start off talking about the Clark study and doll choice. And we have to ask ourselves, well, doll choice, does that have anything to say about how these black children see themselves? If they think that the black doll is uglier than the white doll, do they think that they're uglier than white people? 
uh, you know, exactly what does that mean? And I'll, I'll try to tie that up in a minute or so. But the area of research that directly answers that type of question is on body dissatisfaction. And there's enough research in that area in 2006 for Gabe and Hyde to do a meta-analysis. And here's the main summary table from their meta-analysis. And if this looks confusing, calm down and just read the notes. A positive D, oh, we have a D. What does D mean? That's an effect size for two group T tests. Uh, a positive D indicates that the first group, the first group, scored higher. I always write on journals uh, to allow it to make sense to me, and I would encourage you to do something like it also. And a negative D indicates the second group scored higher on satisfaction. Uh, so let's take a look at how uh, comparisons between black people and white people on their body satisfaction that is, how do you like the way you look? How do you like the way your body is? K, the number of studies. 93 studies looked at white versus black people. And the D is positive, and so a positive D indicates that the first group scored higher on dis dissatisfaction. So whites dislike their bodies more than blacks. That's what that positive D means and the D value is 0.3, what does that mean? Hopefully you should know that's a moderate effect size. So white people are more dissatisfied with their bodies than black people. Uh, you could look at it that way, or black people are less uh, dissatisfied with their bodies than white people. So regardless of what the Clark's Doll study tells us about how black children view themselves as being black based on their doll choice, a more direct way of looking at this across people of different ages is that uh, compared to uh, white people, black people have more body satisfaction than white people. And uh, indeed, uh, you, know, you see that here are negative coefficients here. Oh, I, I just care about here. So that means that black people see their bodies better or have better body satisfaction than Asian Americans or Hispanic Americans. So this is a very powerful statement about, well, what does this all mean? Uh, that is uh, the Clark Dahl study, the research that we have on how African Americans see their own race and their attractiveness is that they're pretty happy with the way they look, or black people are pretty happy with the way they look. And this slide is just reviewing what I said, a small, medium size, effect size. Uh, white women were more dissatisfied with their parent appearance than black women. And this ties into a couple interesting things. Uh, for example, eating disorders have been and still are a problem in our society. Uh, and eating disorders are, you know, among black teenage girls are at lower levels than compared to white teenage girls. And so what this tells us is that there's something that is protecting black teenage girls from the harmful media in our culture. Because we're pretty sure that what's going on is that uh, the more that you're exposed to our media, uh, especially among white girls, the more you're exposed to media, the more likely you're going to develop an eating disorder. And that's because the media presents these images of these, you know, razor thin models uh, who are that thin because number one, genetics, and number two, they starve themselves. Uh, they really do starve themselves. A lot of the models have eating dis disorders themselves. And so what happens as a young girl is when you hit puberty and reach menarche, uh, you start to develop hips. And one thing about puberty is that you put on weight to have a curvy female body. And when uh, you know young white girls see that, they see their body as, you know, moving away from this razor-thin 
uh, standard of beauty and so they begin to diet or try to control their weight which in some cases leads to the eating disorders uh, and researchers feel that there's some resiliency about uh, the African-American community or femininity in African-American communities that protect protects uh, black teenage girls from that effect. So uh, when we tie that into the fact that uh, you know white women are more dissatisfied with their bodies than black women, we're starting to see a pattern here that there are resiliencies in uh, the African-American community that are not in the white community in America or the uh, Caucasian American community. And, uh, you know, that seems to be associated with how you identify with race or how you identify with femininity. And uh, that's a very, you know, complicated to explain exactly what that means. But, uh, you know, in general, uh, black women can identify with femininity without really uh, being affected by the negative, uh, you know, uh, media that we see in our society. And then uh, you tie that into some research on the phenotypic bias which shows that some studies show that black women rate dark, darker skinned black women as more attractive than lighter skinned dark women. We see and then we go back to Clark's study where uh, the students that were in segregated schools uh, didn't have that great of a preference for white dolls over black dolls. We're starting to see that what's going on is there's an effect of systemic racism on black people as they grow up. But then there's this uh, which makes them, you know, value black bodies less than white bodies. But then there's some other resiliency or strength in the American uh, black uh, you know, community, which protects them from much of this damage. And this is something that is probably evolving uh, you know, right now. Uh, and again, this is just my crazy idea. I don't do research in the area, so I really don't know. And uh, really, uh, you know, what can we conclude about this? Well, as I said before, implicit racial stereotypes are in the air. Uh, it's our, in our cultural background. And it causes unwanted implicit prejudice in white people. We've talked about that before. The high extrane, uh, the high, uh, ex, you know, the uh, high uh, unconscious racists uh, and the low, uh, you know, uh, conscious racists, they're a problem. And it also causes implicit prejudice in black people. And part of that is the implicit prejudice against black looking skin and black features. Uh, there's also systemic racism, uh, not just implicit racism. Uh, beauty products. Uh, you know, beauty products are different for white uh, you know, uh, women versus black women. Uh, and different and not the same and also uh, more expensive. Black beauty products are much more expensive than white beauty products. So there's a systemic uh, racism in how our culture views black beauty or the, the beauty of black women or the attractiveness of black women. And that is part of the mix also. Also, uh, photography. Uh, this is both film photography and also uh, you know, electronic photography, that is your cell phone. Uh, you know, film uh, photograph and film photographic paper has a horrible time photographing black people and that's because it wasn't designed to take pictures of white people. Uh, film was designed to take pictures of white people. And so anytime you try to take photographs of black people to make them look beautiful, it's more difficult to do because uh, the system was designed in terms of the chemical composition of the film to take pictures of white people and not to respond at the end of the spectrum for black people.
And you can say, well, that was back in the 1940s. What about today? Certainly our cell phone cameras don't do that. Uh, our cell phone cameras also have to have an algorithm to interpret uh, the pixels. And you can tweak the algorithm however you want. Most of those algorithms are twe tweaked so that white people look better. And that's just, system that's just sy systemic racism. So it's really difficult for black people to have a sense of their own beauty when it's very difficult to have images of them as beautiful people, as they actually are. Even though we have these implicit prejudices and systemic uh, prejudices, we see unique resiliencies in black culture. And that's part of the conclusion. And it fights these negative influences and protects black people and black women from these negative influences of uh, you know, prejudice. And then finally, methodology is important because I've been playing it very uh, loose with different terms I've been using. Uh, and they're not synonymous. And so operational definitions are very important. Uh, that is, uh, when we're talking about doll choice, you know, that's a very clear operational definition, but what concept do we think it applies to? Do we think that the doll choice is related to, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, body satisfaction or the satisfaction on how attractive you look? Well, I've been playing that pretty loose, and that's a little bit too loose. So whenever we look at any of this research, we have to ask ourselves, what exactly do these operational definitions mean? And then finally, we have to ask about methodologies. You see this clearly in the video of the Clark study. You're asking these kids, like uh, these young children, which doll they want to play with, which doll uh, you know, they think is pretty, What's the context? Are they in their school? Is the examiner white? Are they in an institution that they understand to be a white institution being asked these questions? Or are they in an institution that they consider to be a neutral or a black institution? These questions are critically important. And again, uh, because of the systematic uh, racism uh, and systemic racism, I'm using those ter terms interchangeably un, uh, by accident, uh, but they work. Uh, we really don't know because there's not been uh, enough research in this area, which definitely needs more research. Oh, we're almost done. Please join me for the last part of our lecture.